So, welcome, Dr. Alessandro. Uh, firstly, I go to present uh, a little presentation about your your course and your history in the in the, the association uh, of the history uh, course. So, teacher, uh, Dr. Alessandro is associate lecturer at the UCL History. Uh, it's a historian of modern Europe, works uh, at the in intersection of intellectual, conceptual, and cultural history. Uh, he spe uh, specifically works about um, history and cross-cultural encounters. Uh, he is cu currently preparing a monograph uh, about the science of history, uh, Giambat, Tista Vico in European Historical and Political Imagination. Uh, it is a work uh, provide uh, philo philosophical thought uh, in the Germany, France, and Italy in the 19th century. Uh, he completed the postdoctor under the supervision about the Professor Alex Corner and the Professor Avi Lisvich. Uh, okay. Uh, the reception and circulation of Engels' philosophy is the main topic of his thesis of doctoral um, doctoral thesis. Okay, so tonight we have the topic about the uh, French Revolution, uh, and uh, Dr. Alessandro have uh, some information about it to share uh, with us. Uh, Dr. Alessandro, if you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, I'm going to share my presentation with you, PowerPoint, and it should be visible now. So, um, thank you very much. Uh, I really want to thank Zhao and uh, Bruno and Jenny and everyone else of the um, friends and colleagues of the International History Students and Historians Group for having me tonight. I am, as I was explaining uh, earlier before we went live, I am a deep believer in the concept of public history. I think our work and our research, they ought, they must be disseminated widely and uh, sort of beyond the echo chamber of the academic world. So when Joao invited me, I think it was back in September even, I just did not hesitate to agree. It was uh, yes, right away. Um, I think the type of work that you guys are doing here with the group is absolutely amazing and I think that it's precisely these type of initiatives that uh, um, represents the future of uh, historical research in many ways. So once again, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. So I'm absolutely thrilled tonight to be able to speak about one of the most significant and one of the most widely studied events uh, in modern history and I'm talking about the French Revolution. I don't want to take too much time with this presentation, so I just want to make a few overcomplicated, perhaps, remarks. There are basically three thoughts that, um, um, that in some ways represent three historiographic provocations that have to do with the causes and mainly the legacy of the revolution that I would like to discuss with you tonight. So one of the things that I fear the most as a historian is uh, the danger of falling into teleological explanations. So understanding the past as some kind of movement towards um, some predefined goal. So the whole idea, for example, that the French Revolution had been somehow prepared over a period of several decades by the experience of the Enlightenment, for example, I think is something that requires a bit of attention. And we need to maybe rethink some of the aspects of this thesis. Now, of course, the Enlightenment did produce lots of notions like democratic sovereignty, representation, rights of man, this Enlightenment constitutionalism, a certain type of Enlightenment republicanism that were central to the French Revolution. But the point is that the relationship with the Enlightenment is a lot more complicated. It's a lot more uh, nuanced than that. So um, to begin with, the idea of the Enlightenment, the enlightenment is very, very complicated, it's very problematic. Um, because especially in the last couple of decades, more or less, historians have been embracing an increasingly splintered, fragmented, more pluralistic conception of what um, uh, enlightenment is. And actually, they, it's become basically customary to speak of several enlightenments in the plural. Uh, 
But even within the revolution, the French Revolution, we do find a variety of competing enlightenments, which uh, basically conceived and framed the revolutionary experience in different ways. So the first point that I want to elaborate on tonight is that we should take the relationship between enlightenment and revolution very critically. And we really have to challenge this idea that the culture of the French enlightenment led univocally and directly to the events of the French revolution. The second point I wanna make is, um, I wanna take, take issue with those historiographic perspectives that unambiguously view the French revolution as the moment that ushered in an experience of political modernity that the rest of the world just was waiting to be able to embrace. Um, in the eyes of many commentators, even in the late 18th and early, 20th, uh, early 19th century, the French Revolution was actually a lot less revolutionary than we think. Um, and overall, I think the verdict on the impact of the French Revolution is a lot more nuanced than that. And we should take some of these dissenting views seriously, simply because there were so many people that felt that way. And third, and this is the point that I'm most passionate about, we must abandon the stereotype that the French Revolution inspired self-determination and emancipation movements worldwide. This idea of a global diffusion, of a global reception of the French Revolution is actually very, very problematic because in a way it perpetuates the stereotype of European superiority that is inaccurate historically and it's just dangerous ideologically. So world revolutions were first and foremost um, responses to specific political, social, and intellectual and economic circumstances that had nothing to do with what was going on in France in the 18th century. Uh, of course, a lot of the revolutions of the late 18th and the early 19th centuries might have somehow borrowed several political concepts from the language of the French Revolution, but this was not a process of passive absorption. Uh, revolutionaries all over the world restructured this concept to accommodate the specific realities that they were dealing with. Um, and in many cases, this process entailed a conscious attempt to basically distance oneself from what happened in France. So let me go with order. Um, deconstructing the teleological narrative of the French Revolution uh, that experiences the enlightened, um, that links the experience of enlightenment with revolution uh, is something I care about very, very deeply. And in this respect, I think we can make two parallel claims about uh, the enlightenment on the one hand and about the French revolutionary discourse on the other. So in the first case, when it's about the enlightenment, we must get rid of this idea that uh, the Enlightenment was a predominantly French movement that provided the intellectual foundations for the experience of revolution. And this is going to sound like really, really simplistic, I know that, but the historiography of the Enlightenment is full of examples of this perspective. So some of the most celebrated works go in this direction. Let's take, for example, Ernst Cassirer and his 1932 book, the philosophy of the Enlightenment, for example. And this book says that Enlightenment was born in France and in England, and I'm quoting here, by breaking down the older form of philosophical knowledge, the metaphysical systems, and replacing them with a critical philosophy based on reason. It's like, oh, look what the French did. There you go, that's the Enlightenment. And it's very simplistic, and it just doesn't work. We can also mention, for example, Peter Gay, who wrote a legendary two volume study called The Enlightenment and Interpretation in 1966 and 69. And he says the same thing, and he just extends that line of reasoning to include the North American Enlightenment. And lastly, I think more recently, we've got um, um, Isaiah Berlin and his very famous book Against the Current, uh, which is another example of this Francocentric bias. The point here is that what we call the Enlightenment was by no means a homogenous event. Uh, based on this hypothesis, uh, scholars have actually tried to revise this geographical coordinates of Enlightenment from the 80s onwards. So take, for example, the Italian great scholar Franco Venturi, who published a legendary, absolutely seminal, visionary, groundbreaking work called Settecento Riformatore in 1979, which followed his lectures, which were published in English as 
utopian reform in the Enlightenment in 1971. And he challenged this geographic characterization of Enlightenment as a Franco-German thing. And his argument is very, is shockingly simple. He says, if we want to understand the true meaning of Enlightenment, we should not look for it in the context of this wealthy Parisian courts of German or German universities. If you want to understand enlightenment, you have to go and look in those areas of Europe where people truly felt that they needed to improve their predicament in their conditions. It is only here that enlightenment was truly conceived as a strategy basically to ensure the progress of society. So enlightenment did not originate in the so-called centers of Europe, but in the so-called peripheries. And he talks about Scotland and Italy. And a lot of historians like John Robertson, for example, have built upon this intuition. Venturi's works are still referenced so widely in the scholarship on the Enlightenment. Now, another example of this more pluralistic understanding of Enlightenment is a book edited by Roy Porter and Mikolaj Teich uh, called Enlightenment in National Context. And here we see the implications of this idea of looking at the so-called peripheries of Europe, because he, they look at Russia, um, they look at Greece, they look at Scotland, they look at, at the Imperial uh, Iberian Peninsula, they look at Southern Italy. And the idea is that each one of these places had its own version of the Enlightenment. And lastly, I want to mention a wonderful book by John Pocock called Barbarism and Religion which was published in 1999. And this book, he says something very provocative, which I fully agree with. He says, um, historians so far have got this idea of the Enlightenment wrong because no such thing as one, the Enlightenment exists, but it makes much more sense to think of different Enlightenments in the plural that share some family resemblance. And to be honest, I could go on for hours about this, but I don't want to. Um, um, so many people at the present are working to really demolish this idea of one enlightenment. Uh, John Robertson, who wrote this beautiful book, Comparative Study of Naples and Scotland, called The Case for the Enlightenment, does the same thing. Um, uh, and basically the, the, the consensus now is pretty much, the emerging consensus is that enlightenment was a very inhomogeneous, a very disorganized patchwork of often competing claims. And in this respect, I want to quote one of my personal heroes, uh, Professor Sebastian Konrad, who is a professor of global history at the Free University in Berlin. Um, he has a wonderful essay called Enlightenment in Global History. And he says enlightenment should not be regarded as a set of normative propositions, but enlightenment should be regarded as a language, a language in which 18th century arguments about politics, society, economics, and culture were constructed. In some cases, actually, we see it like Russia or Austria, for instance, we see that um, even so, you know, some strands of the French Enlightenment, we see that this language of Enlightenment was used to make a case for autocratic, for despotic politics, for sometimes racial oppression, for imperial exploitation. So we must really rethink this idea that the culture of Enlightenment naturally and directly leads to the concepts that we associate with the French Revolution. Hang on a minute, but wasn't I supposed to talk about the French Revolution? Yes, so what does this mean with regard to the French Revolution? Well, when it comes to the revolution itself, we notice that there are different versions of enlightenment at work in 1789 onwards. So the revolutionary experience erupted in a climate of immense intellectual uncertainty due to which members of the National Assembly could um, barely agree on how to um, steer the revolution because they could draw on a variety of discourses. For example, there's a whole tradition of parliamentarism here that upheld a notion of justice against the arbitrary will of the monarch. And after the beginning of violence, for example, embraced the notion of constitutionalism, which was understood as a uh, limiting condition upon the exercise of royal power. These people were massively inspired by none other than Montesquieu. And intuitively, they hated this idea of popular sovereignty. Um, and they strongly endorsed this idea of representation. But then there was also a discourse of uh, radical republicanism that was inspired by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, especially his idea of a general will. And this, uh, these people said that the um, uh, collective 
collective order and identity were not defined in terms of these absolute principles of justice, uh, but in terms of will, liberty, contingency, choice, participation. So this discourse, challenge, um, this discourse championed a notion of um, popular sovereignty. So you see there's a big difference with the first group uh, and uh, direct participation um, against basically um, uh, both the parliamentarist group as well as the royalists that obviously existed in France. And third, there is a third political discourse, which was a discourse of natural rights um, that was inspired by the physiocrats such as Francois Quenet and chiefly invoked by Emmanuel Joseph Seyer, who is one of the most important and notable revolutionaries of the period. Uh, he's actually the one who drafted the um, much celebrated Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, and he wrote this very important pamphlet called What is the Third Estate, which was one of the most important uh, documents of the revolution. And these people, they actually believed in representative government. They believed in some kind of enlightened rule of reason in uh, a social order recon reconstituted according to natural law and political economy. So this was precisely the set, the set of arguments, by the way, that during the final years of the old regime, so before the revolution, had sustained all those attempts made by the king, by Louis XVI, and actually uh, Necker, his finance minister, to uh, reform the state, uh, to, in to increase administrative uniformity, commercial, commercial expansion, civil rights, fiscal equality, and more participation for poverty owners. So a lot of this, this is to say, a lot of this enlightenment discourse that existed within the revolution borrowed enormously from what was there before. And these are things that even the king was actually quite comfortable with. So this brief digression shows that on the eve of the revolution, the French Enlightenment was massively divided into a plethora of competing propositions. And it's clear that the relationship was a lot more complicated and nuanced than we're used to thinking. Uh, revolutionaries, they didn't just wake up one day and say, let's go in the street and shout, liberté, égalité, fraternité. Uh, the revolution was a process of clashing enlightenments uh, with, uh, with, which proposed competing visions and degrees of reform for French society. But I also think that, you know, avoiding these teleological readings of the French Revolution also means developing a heightened and more accurate uh, understanding of its outcomes, receptions, and ultimately its legacy, which is something that we care about a lot in the West. And this brings me to my second point. Um, a lot of historians argue that the revolution itself was in many ways a failure and reference a plethora of historical circumstances to support this claim. Uh, there are two arguments that I think maybe we just want to cover real quick. Uh, on the one hand, there are those such as Jacob Talman and his wonderful book, Origins of the Totalitarian Democracy in the 50s, and more recently, Jonathan Israel with revolutionary ideas and intellectual history of the French Revolution, who viewed the experience of the terror as the direct outcome of the revolutionary principles that developed in the 1789-92 period. Another argument is that of people like Lynn Hunt, for example, and Jack Sensor, who viewed the rise of Napoleon as the final sort of nail in the coffin um, of um, the revolution and basically reflect on the trauma of the Napoleonic years as a direct implication of the principles of the French Revolution. And actually, we must not forget in the sense that Napoleon and um, much of his appeal in Europe was precisely due to the fact that he presented himself as a veteran of the, the revolution. His colonization of Italy, basically, was a brilliant example. So if you look at, for example, um, Stuart Wolf, he has a incredibly uh, interesting book called uh, Napoleon's Integration of Europe, which despite being very, very brilliant, has one of the weirdest covers I've ever seen on any book. Um, in this book, he actually talks about, um, uh, we see how extensively this imperial project of Napoleon was underpinned by political concepts that had emerged during the French Revolution, such as these ideas of popular sovereignty and constitutionalism. If you look at all the constitutions of 
Italy in the 19, uh, 1796, 99 period. They're all written under the supervision of Napoleon, and yet they contain all this, you know, ra pseudo radical political concepts. Now, I don't think that, by the way, saying that the revolution was a failure is a tenable verdict, not at all. I am actually very agnostic when it comes to assessing the outcome of the revolution. Um, these are very complex verdicts and I don't have time and probably even have the expertise to deconstruct them properly. But I will, what I will say, however, is that these late 20th and 21st century verdicts are well corroborated by a remarkable number of um, 19th and 18th century commentaries on the revolution which to a large extent speak of a very unrevolutionary or somewhat unrevolutionary revolution. This was not just a political critique, but it was a lot deeper. And it came to reject some of the core ideological and philosophical underpinnings of the revolution. Now, the most common argument is that which we find in the writings of uh, Edmund Burke and his 1790 reflections on the revolution in France, which basically accuses the uh, cultural milieu of 18th century France of providing absolutely unstable intellectual foundations for the revolutionary experience. According to Burke, basically politics must not be based on abstractions such as reason, freedom, natural rights, equality, because the risk here is that these abstract concepts can be used to justify tyranny and in some cases violence. Uh, and to be honest, the, the period of the terror, in a way, uh, can be constructed as evidence that Burke had, had seen something here. Um, in Burke's view, politics must be consistent with the concrete reality, um, circumstances and complexity of a particular people. And in this sense, the source of the political must come from within this historically situated community and not some abstract and allegedly universal concept that came from the Enlightenment. So this is why, for instance, Burke says he doesn't believe in the rights of man, uh, which French revolutionaries invoked all the time, but only in the rights of the Englishman, the rights of the Frenchman. So historically situated rights, not absolute rights. Now, a similar argument can be found in the writings of Alexis de Tocqueville, um, and in particular, his 1856 work, uh, The Old Regime and Revolution which criticizes precisely the very same abstract concepts that Burke had taken issue, taken issue with and says that the, all the, the, the revolution had simply failed to erode the political, social, economic, and cultural structures of the old regime. And you know, in many ways, he was right, because an astonishing variety of 19th century thinkers explained that after the French Revolution, European political thinkers were becoming more and more uncomfortable with this supposedly abstract and universal nature of the political concept of the French Revolution. If you take, for example, Madame de Stael, for instance, um, she is an obvious example of this. Um, but the most obvious example for me are the commentaries of Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. I wrote my PhD on Hegel even if you ask me to talk about quantum mechanics, I'll probably squeeze in a couple of references uh, to Hegel. I'm obsessed with the man. I know it's weird, but please don't judge me. Um, in 1820, he wrote his much celebrated philosophy of right. And here we see that his verdict on the events of the revolution is very negative. He says, the lesson that we can draw from the failure of the revolution was that it is not possible to change the constitution and the institutions of a society in complete abstraction from its history, from circumstances like religion, economy, tradition, and national character. As remarked by the immensely brilliant, talented, extraordinary Hannah Arendt in her outstanding work on the origins of totalitarianism, it just took a few weeks since the onset of revolution in 1789, before everybody, well, before a lot of people started questioning the philosophical and ideological underpinnings of, uh, from the standpoint of a proto-communitarian political theory that viewed politics as originating within man-made communities rather than natural or universal concepts. More importantly, she really highlights how politics in the post-Napoleonic era 
embraced precisely this perspective. Uh, she mentions, for example, how the rise of the nation state in the 19th century is to be understood as a reflection of people's inherent need to experience politics from the perspective of their concrete, tangible membership in a community. So this is to say, and I know that I'm going to get a lot of heat for this, the French Revolution did not inaugurate a new era of political modernity. Sure, it did popularize a number of political concepts that appealed to people all over the world. But concretely speaking, it did not signify a radical shift in how politics were conducted. At best, it engendered a number of temporary measures, which a lot of people were still uncomfortable with. Um, and that the Napoleonic period first, and then the Restoration, and then the age of nationalism, kind of promptly circumscribed and to some extent suppressed. So once again, we're confronted with the same historiographic imperative that we encountered before. As historians, we must be very, very, very careful to avoid any kind of teleological association um, of the politics of the French Revolution and any concept of political modernity. So the debate on the outcomes of the revolution unambiguously to me proves that in some respects the political thought of the French Revolution remained a little bit unrevolutionary. And lastly, I want to make a third and final point, which is about the global implications of the French Revolution. And there is this new thing. Now everybody has to be a global historian. Um, it's the new trend in academia, and some people are generally doing great work in that respect. Some people are just jumping on a bandwagon without necessarily knowing what they're talking about. But I digress, I'm getting carried away. It's a much discussed topic. People are talking about the global French Revolution quite a lot now. And I don't want to deny some of the impressive achievements of the revolution. Abolition of serfdom, abolition of the privileges of the nobility, the introduction of a whole new set of concepts in the political lexicon of modern Europe. But I do want to take issue with particular historiographic perspectives, particular diffusionist perspectives that understand every late 18th century revolution as a peripheral effect of the French Revolution. Now, of course, things like the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen of 1789 Things like that were important reference points for revolutionaries all over the world. But all these revolutions, such as that which took place in the French colony of Saint Domingue, that was then called Haiti late after the revolution from the 1790s onwards, or that which took place in my hometown of Naples in 1799, they had a significance of their own. Uh, they were chiefly prompted by very specific local circumstances, such as the structural conflicts existing within the, uh, the Caribbean slaveholding society in the former case, and the fact that the House of Bourbon was responding in some type of weird way to Napoleon's involvement in Italy um, in the latter case. So I think in this respect, I just want to talk very briefly about the French, the Neapolitan Revolution to explain what I mean, and then I promise I'll shut up. Uh, the Neapolitan Revolution can explain with impeccable clarity the extent to which uh, this revolution, instead of being far from being a peripheral manifestation of the French Revolution, uh, not only was the result of local context and circumstances, but also consciously attempted to distance itself from the French events. So let me explain. During the 1799 revolution, Neapolitan patriots established a provisional government with 20 members who immediately set out to write a constitution for the newborn Neapolitan Republic. So two aspects of this constitution I think are very interesting. First, the fact that despite being loosely inspired by the French constitution of 1793, but so were every, so was every other constitution being written in Italy in that period. Um, the Neapolitan constitution draws almost exclusively from the local tradition of Neapolitan enlightenment, as opposed to the political thought originating on the other side of the Alps. Uh, so works by Neapolitan political economists and legal scholars such as Antonio Genovesi, Gaetano Filangeri, Francesco Mario Pagano, they were consulted extensively by the Constitutional Commission and their influence can, is absolutely clear in, in the text. And at the time, I think, maybe I'm being a little bit patriotic here, 
uh, no other Republican constitution in Italy could benefit so massively from a local tradition and expertise. Second, the constitution acknowledged and tried to overcome some of the perceived problems and shortcomings of the French Revolution. For instance, we find here an extremely uh, strong emphasis on the idea of the division of power, which states that legislative and executive powers must be in the hands of different bodies on account of the fact that an abuse of executive power was the problem that had led to the French terror. As a means of avoiding such abuses of executive power, the Neapolitan constitution created a special institution called Eforato, which is a special commission tasked with ensuring constitutional legitimacy in the administration of power. So think of it as some sort of um, constitutional court. That's really what it was. And this was entirely absent in the provisions of the French constitution or any other 18th century European constitution, by the way. Um, and that, this can also be extended to the discussion of many political concepts that we find in the constitution. So, for example, the discussion of equality within the constitution is another good example of how openly Neapolitan revolutionaries uh, resolved to distance themselves from their French counterparts. Um, so, in every single French constitution, for example, equality is discussed as a fundamental right. In the Neapolitan constitution, instead, equality is labeled a principle. It's actually the first and the most important of all constitutional principles. It was born from reason and it had incredible moral force. Now, Francesco Mario Pagano, who was a jurist who contributed more than anyone else to the writing of this constitutional document, he wrote, we have benefited, and this was a speech that he gave when he presented the constitution. We have benefited from the declaration opening the French constitution, but we have still advise that equality is not a right of man, according to the previously mentioned declaration, but solely the basis of all rights and the principle on which they are established and founded. Equality is a relationship. Rights are faculties. Now, you might think this is just like a definition. It's a sophistry. Well, this little distinction actually has massive implications. Um, it played a key role when it came to justifying theoretically the presence, and this is the first time in a constitutional document, of constitutional duties alongside rights. In the French revolutionary constitutional thought, the legitimacy and even the priority of duties over rights emerged from a more or less vague negative conception of guaranteeing in every way possible the preservation of society. In Naples, instead, because of this different conception of equality, we find a positive conception which complements the notion of rights of the people with a precise set of civic obligations. So what we find here are two different conceptions of Republican constitutionalism, whose differences, as many historians, such as the wonderful Vincenzo Ferrone uh, said, boil down to one simple fact, that Neapolitan patriots were aware of the perceived limitations of the political thought of the French Revolution. And so they tried to fix those shortcomings, to amend them in their own constitution. This, and this is my final very, very last thing to say, this tells us something very important about how the French Revolution was experienced abroad. The French Revolution was not seen as a model to imitate passively, but as an example to engage with critically it was a sounding board to assess the viability of domestic reform. So patriots in Naples, just like their counterparts in the Caribbean and in Latin America, did not attempt to fashion their politics as a mirror image of the great French politics, of the great French Revolution, but they were actually very critical of the stuff that had happened in France. In consequence, we, I think we must seriously rethink these diffusionist models that view the global wave of 18th century revolutions as peripheral emanations of the French example. Anyway, I think I've spoken too much. And I would love to have a chat about all these wonderful things. I think we're here to confabulate, as Jao says. So the whole point I'm making here is this. The French Revolution was great. The French Revolution had a remarkable historical significance. But we must be very, very, very careful when we explore it as historians. This might sound, again, as I said at the beginning, very simplistic, but 
the fact that we're even having this conversation in the first place maybe signifies that having a conversation on this topic is actually really worth having. So thank you very much for listening to my ramblings. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alessandro. Um, and then allow me three things. First of all, this actually was an amazing way to, to look at French Revolution, uh, putting aside what we already know. Second, the PowerPoint was amazing, and you are an amazing communicator as well. You have to thank um, University College London History Department because the amount of training that we had over the summer on how to use digital platforms to improve our teaching, you know. So if I look at my PowerPoints from my lectures last year, they were like, yeah, okay. And then now it's like, boom, interactive, things appearing, disappearing. I couldn't put any memes in the lecture tonight, uh, which I normally do, but, you know, I only had- It was memes. amazing, really. I have uh, an immediate, immediate uh, question. The thing, yeah. uh, <laughs> the thing is that I want to ask, ask you is, um, is the French Revolution, uh, are we uh, still feeling the echoes of the, the French Revolution? I mean, since the French Revolution, um, uh, we have seen that never, there was a, a never stable, not stable, may, maybe because we are speaking about structures, but if we look at before the, the French Revolution and, uh, and um, okay, the times were different, but everything was seemed to be more stable, more uh, uh, confirmed, there was a, a um, confirmation. And after this, the, 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 the French Revolution, what we've seen is a, a lots of revolutions. And as you said, um, it, it, it differs from country to country, from culture, from uh, everything. The, the, the notion of the revolution was different and, and the, 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 what people was, were expecting from the revolution was also different. We see Russia, as you pointed, we, we see the, uh, the Iberian and, uh, and the way that they, they, they took that, that notion, that concept of, of revolution. But the thing is that a lot of things have happened, including the, the, um, the, the totalities, uh, I mean, uh, those uh, regimes like uh, Hitler, like uh, Lenin, like uh, extremes. So are we still feeling the echoes of the, that revolution? Is the revolution ended? Had, is it ended or? Yes, that is, okay, I'm gonna have to take <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, you know, I, I said uh, 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 just a question, but I've made a lot of... This is, this is what we're here for tonight, right? We're here to talk about these things. We're not here to do a quiz, right? <laughs> so, um, okay. I have two uh, questions, so... Um, <laughs> maybe, okay, so I think Jenny's question was interesting, but this can really, really sort of take some time. So maybe what I think we could do... Uh, uh, shall we just take Bruno's question? Yes. And then I'll answer both? Yes. Perfect. So, uh, my first question is, uh, can we consider the French Revolution and the American Revolution as Western revolutions? And uh, the second is, uh, the French Revolution was uh, indeed a multinational and transnational uh, uh, revolution? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, very good point. Okay, so um, I'll start actually with Jenny's question because I think some of the stuff that I'm going to say now will be context for uh, Bruno's question. So um, there are two things that really struck me about your, uh, your question. It was a fantastic question. Like it's the kind of question that I really hope that students ask me in class. Um, so I think. Um, the, we are still feeling, we felt since 1789, to some extent, the French Revolution, because in my presentation, I've talked a lot about the, the experience of the revolution. I've talked about the, poly, the political thought of the French Revolution, the idea of the revolution. But what I haven't talked about enough, simply because it's a whole other can of worms, the whole Pandora's box, is the symbolic value of the revolution. So you will find that there is, that the, the, the language as well, but even like, the memory of the French Revolution are cons constantly evoked in all those revolutions that took place after the Napoleonic experience. I'm thinking about the constitutional movements of the 1820s. I'm talking about the 1830s revolution, the 1848 revolution. You know, there was this sense of um, 
a serious a wave of revolution that's happening and it seems that the french revolution the 1789 94 revolution in a way got there first and i think um sometimes you know the, the beautiful thing about this intellectual transfers is that the content of these ideas they move is relatively unimportant because very often people attributed meaning to ideas um, as they were using them the the um, the, the concepts that were uh, evoked in the french in the french revolution in 1789 despite being invoked in 1848 for example they had a completely different connotation in in the other context so looking at these things in context help us clarify these things as historians but in people's imagination there was a very strong connection between these experiences and part of this has to do with um, the other point that you were talking about, this idea of, since that uh, one of the interesting things about the French Revolution is that before that it was stable, there was like not much historical change. And then all of a sudden, boom, 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 everything starts changing very, very quickly. I think, so my favorite thing written in the 20th century is an article, well, it's an essay by Hannah Arendt, called The Concept of History, Ancient and Modern. And basically this book says that um, people understood history um, as cycles for a long time. And because they understood these things based on um, nature. So day and night cycle, the season, the harvest. And actually, if you look at a lot of, uh, you know, uh, pre-modern sources, you will find that there is an abundance. In, this, is, this happens in cultures worldwide, globally. There is an abundance of um, um, ways of measuring time by using kind of natural descriptors. And we still do that. Think about it. I'll be with you in the blink of an eye. That is a physiological function we use to measure time, basically. Um, but because of the nature of these measurements, history was seen as a cyclical thing. And then something happens around the uh, early modern period, and I think John Pocock with the Machiavellian moment is a very, very good text here. The people started really asking themselves, how long is this repeatability ensured? How long will this cycle go on? Could and how many times? Sorry? And how many times? Exactly. And is the Could cycle you? always the same? Exactly. Could it be that something is going to change in the future? Like the birth of modern politics for John Pocock happens when, when uh, the Machiavellian prince asks himself, how viable is this uh, idea of um, uh, the repeatability of historical examples? And basically between the 17th and 18th century, people start developing this idea that the future is not something that's based on the repetition of the past, but it's more of an open book. <laughs> And this is a very, very powerful intuition. There's a wonderful German historian called Reinhard Koselle. I think it's Mari, could it be? Okay, there we go. Perfect. Yes, I did. Um, there's a wonderful German historian Reinhard Koselle. Um, he writes a book called uh, Futures Past, The Semantics of Historical Time. It's a book that has influenced my PhD thesis immensely and that my PhD supervisor has um, um, uh, absolutely introduced me to and, and he just changed my outlook on history as a discipline. And one of the things that are said in this book, and it's the same thing that Anna Arendt says in her essay, is that during this period, we start seeing that people start interrogating the future. What can we do? to make the future conform to our desire, our wishes, our expectations. If we're not sure that our, our past is going to repeat in our future, then maybe we can do actively something to make sure that our politics, our society, our economy in the future are like what we hope. So there is a sense of historical agency that people acquire around the beginning of enlightenment, which is, in my view, the greatest revolution in modern thought. And politically, this translates into the idea of political change being not only invoked more prominently, but being massively um, enforced directly through revolution. Uh, think about it. The fact that there is a transition from the divine right of king, 
So what he did is this absolute, you know, unchangeable notion of mon what monarchy is and where the political, the, the source of power comes from. To this idea of popular sovereignty, it's people's actions. It's the community that decides what kind of constitution we're going to get, what kind of politics we're going to have. This really tells you that people are acquiring a greater consciousness of what they can do to change politics. And, and I think it's part of this broader experience of temporality. It's part of this broader temporal shift of people understanding that what really matters for the future is what we make. The person that, as part of the Enlightenment, said this clearly is, why are we surprised? Of course, it's someone from Naples. I've obviously been very facetious here and always talking about Naples, but Giambattista Vico, the guy whom I'm writing a book about, he has this incredibly mind-blowingly interesting concept um, in a book called uh, On the Most Ancient Wisdom of Italians. It came out in 1710. And in this book, he uses this Latin expression, which is verum esse ipsum factum. That which is true is that which is made. And this intuition is at the core of one of the most extraordinary books ever written, which is The New Science that he wrote in 1725. That's why my book is called The New Science of History. It's, of course, a, a homage to this great text. And um, Jonathan Israel, in his one, well, I don't know if it's wonderful. A lot of people don't like it. I personally like it, so um, fight me. Uh, he has a, this book on the Radical Enlightenment, and he talks about, he has a wonderful interpretation of Vico as a Radical Enlightenment thinker, because he says, you know, this idea of verum factum is exactly the deepest and strongest uh, philosophical validation for these ideas of revolution, of changing politics, of us actively changing politics. Uh, that which is true is that which is made. That which is true is that which is man-made. History is human creation. And a hundred years ago, people were still saying that history is a repetition of cycles that mirrors the cycles existing in nature. So I think that's the big, why, you know, the big intellectual context for this explosion of revolutionary experiences. So I hope that answers your question, Jenny. Uh, Bruno, your questions were interesting, very, very interesting. American and French revolutions, were they Western? Well, here's the thing. Yes and no. Yes, because um, if there's one thing that the Enlightenment has created everywhere, that is a very strong sense of Eurocentrism, actually Western centrism. If you look, I mean, the Enlightenment rests on a global basis. There are what Sebastian Conrad calls conditions of globality that um, shape what Enlightenment means. So the Enlightenment is a response to, but well, every Enlightenment is in a way a response to an experience of globalization. But how did these people you know, uh, experience globalization. Well, they did that by, um, you know, I think it's almost a defense mechanism, but they kind of created all these theories that justified some absolutely rational asymmetries. So if you look at, for instance, uh, something, I don't know, the, the Malaspina expedition in 1798 from the Spanish uh, Admiralty. The idea was go and look at these populations in the peripheries of the world, in Patagonia, and then go all the way to Alaska because you want to see this, how people work, how people function. And by doing that, you can then, because they're not as developed, as modern as we are, you know, we can use them, you can turn them into more efficient colonial subjects. So there are these big asymmetries which are justified using the language of universities, etc. And I think in many ways, the Western um, revolutionary experiences in France and in uh, America, they do in a way reflect um, that. They do rest on a sense of modernity, which is being embodied by the revolutionary experience. And once again, this is exactly the argument that we get in Hannah Arendt. She has this beautiful book on revolution, which starts with this idea that revolution is, the, the central character of revolution is this, she calls it pathos of novelty. And central to revolution is this idea that you are enacting modernity. And if your idea of modernity is Western centric, then the politics that your revolution will, um, will engender will be obviously a reflection of that. 
But uh, the reason why I said at the beginning, it is, but it's also not Western, is that I think it's, um, by the way, the, the French Revolution we see in the French Enlightenment and in the political thought of the French Revolution, we do get this idea of modernity a lot more prominently, simply because in America, people did not have a sense of history that was as developed as it was in France, because by that point, you know, with the American Revolution, you know, you can't talk of this kind of long lasting American nation. So we know our past, we can mold our future. If you look at the political thought of 18th century America, actually I'm teaching this tomorrow at 11. So it's good that we're having a chat about this now. Um, there is a, a much greater contestation of what it means for America to be modern, but it is still within the boundaries of the relationship between America and Europe. That is really the big content contentious issue. So there is still this Western focus. But I think that it's also not exclusively Western. And in this sense, I feel like that we really have to take on board the arguments of someone like Sebastian Conrad and this idea that there is an idea of uh, globalization that's affecting all these things. There is this experience of globality that's, that's shaping the mentalities of the people in the 18th century. And we just cannot deny that. And that means that there is a big transnational element. Transnational element is actually probably a very good uh, entry point to the discussion of to kind of challenging this how western was this revolution because uh, if you take someone like Montesquieu for instance someone who was invoked all the time in um, the context of the political debate of 1789 you will find that Montesquieu in the spirit of the laws he has some extremely interesting views about commerce in uh, he was a, a he produced wine, so he, in his own biography, he had, you know, he had engaged very extensively with this idea of commerce, and he was massively aware of how commerce was handled in the Mediterranean area. He traded a lot with Spain, he traded a lot with uh, uh, Naples, and actually, if, if he didn't trade directly, we know for a fact that he was conscious of the political economy and ideas of political reform outside of um, France. At the same time, Montesquieu is also somebody that justifies political reform on the basis of a highly climatological idea of humankind. The Persian letters, for example, he has this very orientalized understanding of the Orient, which stems from this idea that in France they've got nice climate and in Europe we have good climate and they don't. And that's why they're incapable of sustaining effective political reform. So there is a global element going on here. But the response to the, to the experience of globality is this uh, Western centrism, this Western bias. So it's a revolution and the thought that drove it is in many ways a bit of both. At the same time, time I'm, I'm sorry, the French Revolution uh, brought the, the concept of uh, equality. And uh, at the same time, we've seen, in, uh, for instance, in specifically for women, because we are speaking here about men, uh, how about how they th the, 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 the ways uh, they, they were uh, thinking and in, in, uh, the intellectuals, uh, they were men. We have seen only in the, in the 20th century, um, this kind of uh, discussion being made by, the, by uh, a, a woman. And we know that women uh, always try to have, uh, they fought to have the, the same rights. And we know, we also know that uh, all these movements and uh, they, they, they started to, to, to raise uh, with the French Revolution. They, they tried to, to, to pick up also their rights, right? Yeah. But how much it was uh, equal if women were not uh, considered as, 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 uh, as equal as men? I mean, uh, is this a biological thing? Is this an ideological thing? Is this a political thing? What is this? Jenny, once again, you're coming up with the, with the good questions. <laughs> uh, I, I am so incredibly passionate about the links between what people call Enlightenment feminism and the French Revolution. Um, I mentioned earlier this guy called Joseph Emmanuel Seyer, or Emmanuel Joseph Seyer. Um, and he wrote, you know, there's the big declaration that he contributed to drafting the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. 
There is another document that I think is very equally interesting that, that people don't um, uh, talk about, which is the Declaration of the Rights of Women and of the Female Citizen by Olympe de Gouges. And this was also written in the same years. Um, Olympe de Gouges did not end up as nicely as uh, uh, CIA. In After the terror, CIA with the army, um, who was led by this guy, I think Napoleon, someone might have heard of him, they just kind of seized power and he was one of the three kind of leaders of the, of the new government. Uh, this was just a few months after the terror had actually executed Olympe de Gouges. Um, the French revolutionary experience was very ambivalent with regard to women. Um, one of the most interesting moments, however, is this um, the moment when women marched on Versailles, uh, protesting for the shortages of bread and protesting against this rumor that basically the king might have been hoarding grains because he wanted to throw a party to thank the National Guard or something like that. There is a participation of women, but I think it's not formally discussed by historians as it should. Uh, the fact that one of the implications of the big declaration of the rights of men was the declaration of the rights of women should warrant, in my view, substantial historical effort. So I think the problem here is more with historians than with history. But at the same time, the author, the author immediately thought about when you were asking your wonderful question was um, one of the most important people who ever walked the earth, and that's Mary Wollstonecraft, who actually lived just a few blocks away here in London. Mary Wollstonecraft, she writes the um, um, Vindication of the Rights of Women, um, following her first vindication in 1790, because the, the rights of women in 92 and the rights of man is... Uh, uh, um, 1790, in response to Edmund Burke. You remember I mentioned Burke as this big critic of the, of the French Revolution. She does something absolutely terrific in that book. So she is absolutely defending these principles of, French, of the French um, Revolution. She is a strong believer in the facts of it. But at the same time, she's going well beyond the purely political thing. Uh, the, pol the purely political theory. You mentioned something about, is it ideological or is it scientific? And that is the perfect question to understand Mary Wollstonecraft, Because she invokes these ideas of equality that come from the French Revolution um, as against all this kind of tradition of, um, uh, what were they called? This kind of like guidebook literary genre of uh, rule books on how women should behave. Um, which were the, some of the most sexist literature ever conceived. Um, and she talks very much about how we, through the amelioration of education, the improvement uh, uh, um, of social relations within the family and equality within the household, we really get, to, everybody gets to reap the benefit of it. And more importantly, we get to achieve a genuine form of enlightenment. But at the same time, she does something really interesting. There's a, um, a particular line in the um, um, vindication where she says something like, she takes issue with this idea that women are regarded as the missing link. She really uses this expression, the missing link. And what she's invoking here is this whole discourse that, I mean, some of you who are familiar with, for example, love, joy, and the idea of the great chain of being, you will start seeing some similarities. Um, the idea that women were some kind of biologically inferior to man. Uh, it's the missing link between apes and man, like male. Um, and what she's basically doing here, she's saying that this idea of equality is attached to personhood, and this idea of personhood is actually non-gender, because she's invoking this enlightenment scientific discourse of what makes a person a person. And the Enlightenment kind of agree, Enlightenment scientists in France agreed that it's not the physical attributes, it's really the, um, the soul. Uh, I mean, if you want later, I can talk to you, talk to you more about this because it's a very fascinating aspect. But she basically says, so if 
what makes a person is immaterial. It's the soul. It doesn't have genitals. Then clearly it's the personhood is non-gendered. So we all experience personhood the same way. So we should have equality. So what I find really interesting about Wollstonecraft is that we see how all these enlightenment discourses of gender, they kind of come together. And you have both these, yes, let's use the tropes of the French Revolution to, to justify this idea of equality. But let's also use, let's also turn this enlightenment discourse of science against itself and make a case for gender equality. I think it's very, very fascinating. Thank you. Bruno, I don't know if you want to add any questions. No, I don't have many questions. <laughs> so one, one aspect that I think it will, and probably I'm completely wrong, but it, it will be good to try to understand is when the French Revolution happened, um, can we firmly say right now that we can, okay, the French Revolution start because people are very, and I will use this word, pissed off, people are not very happy. Um, or can we actually say that that is not as true in, in the whole, but there was actually a weaponized, the population was in a certain way weaponized as well to fulfill middle class, what they really wanted to happen in a sense, because if we take um, multi um, sorry, a multidisciplinary approach and we, for example, touch in psychology, um, how population or, or the, the peasants, let's say, from that time and how they are used to a type of government for thousands of years uh, suddenly decided to have that change. And not only that, but the religion occupied like a very high position in society and suddenly going against the king, it was almost going against the gods. So it was like a mortal scene, let's say. So can we actually say that the people were weaponized in a sense to fulfill what the middle class were looking for? That is a very, very good question. I think it's one of the biggest debates on the French Revolution. I think this is really where you see a distinction between different types of scholarship. Uh, there is a uh, predominantly francophone uh, scholarship that goes in the direction of, of saying that this is probably like a um, this sense of middle class a, a bourgeois agency here. Um, I can think of, for example, um, Georges Lefebvre, for instance, who was a Marxist historian. Um, I can think, well, the whole Marxist historiography basically said that, that, you know, the French Revolution was, uh, I mean, of course, Marxism has this very teleological idea of economic development. So in a way, they did not like this they were very sensitive to the Hegelian critique of the revolution, so that's too abstract. But at the same time, they said it's good because it really ushered in this kind of capitalist economy, which is that we need that to get later on to communism. Um, so if you construct the French Revolution from that perspective, um, Albert Mathieu is, is someone else, by the way. That, that, but I think uh, uh, Georges Lefebvre is the, 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 the main proponent of this view. Um, if you accept that the French Revolution played this big role in the establishment of capitalism, then it's clear that the French Revolution did the, perpetuated the class interests of an emerging um, uh, bourgeois class. But um, if you look at... Um, what people on the other side of the channel were saying more or less in the same years and actually someone who in some really weird ways one of my predecessors uh, Alfred Cobbett who was at UCL um, he wrote this book in 1964 called The Social Interpretation of the French Revolution in which he says it's actually not really a, um, a uh, Marxist analysis it's not really a bourgeois phenomenon but it's actually uh, it really starts with the poor so what you were talking about, Joao, is a big historiographic question. Who, was, who were the revolutionaries? What were the class interests of the revolutionaries? And in this respect, I actually personally, personally, particularly like the view of Francois Furet, uh, French historian, 1978, he wrote a, book, wrote a book called Interpreting the French Revolution, which I think is the one that has stood the test of time better than many other. 
big you know, explanations of the French Revolution. And what he says is that it's actually a combination of many factors. And we probably as historians, we also need to start accepting that there is a certain degree of chance happening here. Uh, in the sense that there is a big philosophical kind of radical basis for it. There are all these French philosophs and there is Rousseau, for instance, who massively inspired the political theory of the French Revolution. But at the same time, we do have um, the juxtaposition of certain bourgeois class interests, but also we have these extremely powerful grievances that um, come from the poor. So you can actually see that Fourier is being more conciliatory among these trends. Now, why do I like uh, Fourier so much? Because you can really understand a lot of what happened, especially in the first part of the revolution, uh, very, very clearly. Um, if you look at the national, uh, well, the states general, as they were convened by the king, and then the national assembly, look at the distribution of people. I think a very interesting shift happens when um, represent, so basically, initially, there were 600 representatives for the third estate, so basically, the peasantry, mainly, the, the poor people. And they were 95% of the French population. So that's kind of, you know. And then there's 300 um, representatives for the first state and 300 representatives for the second state. 600 versus 300 plus 300, which means voting was impossible. Of course, when we're talking about modernizing the French state, because of the social dynamics and the context, there were some really severe issues at stake, such as should the nobility be taxed, such as should the clergy be taxed, such as should the nobility give up some of its exemptions and privileges. So you can imagine that first and second estate, estate were voting together, the third estate was voting against. What is interesting here is that whatever they voted, there was, it was just 600 versus 300, there was no absolute majority, it was, it was completely locked the situation. But the big thing happens with the famous tennis court oath, where the, um, when the revolutionaries decide, what well, the members of the third estate is, listen, we represent 95% of the people. We can't help, you can't let 95, in this room, we can't let 95% of the French population be hostage to the whims of this remaining 5%. I mean, this really, uh, prescient, you know, there's a sense of what's happening today almost going on. So what, what we're going to do, we're just going to say, right, we're out of here. We are going to assemble as a different institution. It's no longer the States General, and we are the representatives of the people. Now, that's a big thing, because you see that in the language of the revolution, there is a, um, at some point, there is a sense that we're kind of abandoning this kind of division, division in estates. It really becomes a matter of, look, we're 95% of French citizens and it doesn't really matter. We are, we're on, in the same, on the same boat. We're in this together. Um, so interestingly, there isn't much of a sense of bourgeoisie versus proletariat at this stage. And I think that's on the one hand what makes all this essentialist reductionist interpretations such as that of Mathieu's or the Marx interpretation, uh, a bit untenable. Because within the definition of the middle class, really also of, of the emerging bourgeoisie, you, alongside them, you have the proletariat. But in, in, on the other hand, it makes um, Fouret's interpretation more, more interesting to me. But the, other, the flip side of this is that it makes it very, very, very difficult to distinguish between the different class interests. Uh, but then it becomes a domino effect because then you have one division is between, you know, middle class and lower class. But then you also have another big division between city and countryside. You have a big division depending on the type of job, a certain a different division depending on family structure. So it becomes a little bit of a slippery slope. And that's why I personally feel like if, if I just look at the revolutionary experience, I think it's probably best to stick with the... Um, the actual political debate and see who was voting on behalf of whom. And in this respect, I see that there is a bit, the, the middle class, the emerging middle class and the um, lower classes coming together. And final point, we should not 
be tricked into believing that Paris was some kind of like ultra modern metropolitan urban center at the time. The vast majority of, if you look at the, the data of like the people, where they, who they were and where they lived in 18th century France, you will find that I think now it's like one every six people in France lives in Paris, something like that. It's like really staggering. At the time, it was one every 300 people live in Paris. It's, um, uh, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's completely different from now. The vast majority of the people lived in the countryside. So when we talk about the, an emerging bourgeoisie in the French Revolution, it's still something that numerically yielded little power and, and little economic power, because the economic power was very, very much distributed in the countryside among the members of the nobility. And that's why, for instance, King Louis XVI, he felt that he really had to reform the administration of the countryside, because the place as big as France, with power being so unfortunately devolved to all these local barons, etc. It was impossible to govern it efficiently from a place like Versailles. So, yeah, I think the class composition of the revolution is a very interesting topic. Thank you so much, Alessandra. Um, we have a question from Telma, uh, who is watching us here. She said, uh, good evening, Dr. Alexandra. Can we say that the greatest legacy left by the French Revolution in terms of rights of the law would be the tripartition of the powers? It's a good question. I mean, not, the French Revolution did not invent it, but I mean, really in, in kind of Roman times, you, you see doctrines of division of power. But the French Revolution did something with this idea of divisions of power that had not been done before, which is the fact that it showed what can go really wrong when you base democracy on division of power. And I'm talking about the terror. In the 19th century, there are more people in the immediate aftermath of the revolution. Uh, there are more people that write about the comment on the terror than on the achievements of the revolution. So what the French Revolution did was saying, this is why you really, really have to provide the perfect case study of why you need division of power. So I think maybe that's not what the revolutionaries meant to do, Telma, but I'll tell you that's what it did. It really is. And the history of the terror, I think, is incredibly fascinating. Um, I, so I teach this course at uni on the French Revolution. One week is just about the terror. It's so interesting. And the most important point is exactly um, this doctrine of division of power and how important it becomes in the context of uh, that experience. Thank you, Alexander. And I, I have just one last question, if you allow me. Um, looking at the approach that, that you have about the, the French Revolution and not being specifically to do with, with, with our um, subject, but how do you see the use of a multidisciplinary uh, um, uh, in terms of history to analyze certain things that happen in history to have like a more conclusive uh, um, um, answer. Because nowadays as historians, I can see that a lot of people like to have obviously objective answers, but sometimes that is impossible. Um, and we make some mistakes like we do in French Revolution, where we tend to look in just one way, uh, forgetting everything there is around. So. How, what, what do you think about the using of other sciences to help us reach a conclusion about that? That's such a good question. I think it must be multidisciplinary. That's where the future is. We've got to a point where the specialization is becoming a bit of an issue. Um, as historians, the research is just 50% of our job. The other 50% is the teaching. And when you teach, you have to be able to talk about a broad array of subjects, not just your PhD thesis. You know what I mean? So uh, it's not 50-50. There's like a good 30% of admin nowadays, but that's a different story. Uh, no, but this is to say, um, I think as historians, we must welcome multidisciplinarity. It is such a useful uh, resource, specifically when it comes to the French Revolution, um, I, well, my PhD supervisor would be the right person to talk about now because he would come up with some grand 
history of opera and opera in the French Revolution, how we should, but this is to say, not just the French Revolution, any revolution is not just a political thing. Any revolution is basically something which affects people in different ways. It affects people um, as um, uh, political actors, it affects people as um, uh, consumers of a revolutionary culture. And that is something that I find extremely fascinating. I'm going to give an example. Take the whole 1848 revolution thing in Italy. Now, this story is problematic, but there is this whole idea of Verdi as being this great patriotic Italian composer. You know, so there is a sense of let's look at the 1848 revolutions through the, the production and the reception of particular operas, the Nabucco Verdi. Now, just see the parenthesis. It wasn't Verdi was not a patriotic composer. If I don't say this, my supervisor who will probably watch this thing at some point, he's gonna say, mm, Alessandro, I'm flying, why aren't you um, talking about Verdi? Um, he's gonna kill me for this. I'm sorry. But this is the same. Um, the reception of someone like Wagner, for instance, in 1840, in, in 1840s, 1850s Italy is a lot more interesting than what was going on with Verdi. But there is a big historiographic argument, a big historical argument that's being made here. Do we look at this cultural history of revolution? The conversation, the chat we just had about the class they mentioned of the revolution. Is there a social history of the revolution? Oh yeah, totally. So within history, there are so many macro and micro approaches that we can take that are very, very interesting. And then we talked about opera, we're talking about some musicology, but then literature must come into play. If you think about the sentimental education, that wonderful book that's set in the 1848 revolution, that is a wonderful, you know, uh, a testimony of what it was like in the mind of a young romantic, um, you know, to, Basically, to just want to have a lot of sex, but not being able to because the revolution is happening outside your door. Um, and so I think narrow historiographic perspectives are extremely limiting. And I think the risk with how we do history is that we go more and more in that direction. And I do think that another example, you know, for instance, transnational history that was Bruno we were talking about earlier. Um, I did a liberal arts degree. I did mostly political philosophy, but I did a lot of international relations. I did a lot of uh, migration studies even. And for me, being able to incorporate those theories in my study of how ideas move is central to my work as a historian. And then people think, oh, it's such an esoteric thing. No, it's just that for me, it's, it's natural. So this is to say, I think going in a multidisciplinary direction is very, very important. And something which is so big and has such a big symbolic value like the French Revolution, I think lends itself so easily to a more, um, how can I put it, multidisciplinary approach, absolutely. So now we are to the end. Uh, anyone have uh, any questions? So. No, for me, I'm not. Okay, I don't want to Some take more questions from the that. audience. <laughs> no? I wanna, no, I think this is, uh, I, I don't see anyone in the chat or, Okay. So, Professor, um, we are, don't uh, want to take more uh, for your time. Uh, it was an amazing presentation. Uh, we are very exciting for a new, uh, a new presentation about uh, another topic. And uh, we, we end uh, this conversation uh, with uh, my friend, Jean Villegas. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, um, this is great. I, uh, I mean, I hope you don't mind. Uh, I will probably link this thing to, like, instead of doing the lecture in... Please do it. <laughs> yes. Oh. yes. Um, Thank you. Responsibility, but please. <laughs> this was extremely interesting. We've talked about so many interesting topics. I think the questions were really, 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 really cool. Uh, <laughs> but I think overall, this whole initiative of confabulating is um, exceptional. I think this is uh, this is really what must be done. And I think I obviously wish you all the best in continuing with this project. And hopefully we can get to work together again. Uh, hopefully, yes. Hopefully, yes. If you want yes. to talk about the 1848 revolutions, <laughs> let me know. We can and look I, it. Yes, and I still have a long questions to make. <laughs> <laughs> yes.
<laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It was really nice. It was really, really good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Alison. And thank you everyone who is watching us as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.